Hey, I'm Kale, and I have a new background. And not only that, I'm also looking at the Jimi Hendrix Experience debut album, Are You Experienced? But yeah, Are You Experienced was the newly formed Jimi Hendrix Experience first debut album, released May of 1967. Let's talk about anything else about this album. I'm going to talk about the formation of the band and how they came to be. The story of the band's formation starts in around 1964 with Jimi Hendrix, who was just kind of failing to become a R&B uh, session guitarist. But around late 1964, he finally started successfully uh, his own band called Jimmy James and the Blue Flames. They didn't put out any singles or anything, but basically, he just they just played in clubs around the U.S. playing covers of charting pop hits like um, Rain by the Beatles or um, the Animals version of The House of the Rising Sun and putting like an R&B flair on it. And they were pretty unsuccessful until around maybe April or May um, of 1966 when they played a pretty eventful show in uh, New York where former Animals bassist Chaz Chandler was there. And the Animals had just recently broken up. They all kind of parted different ways and Chaz Chandler was looking for a group to produce and possibly be in to you know, reinstate the Animals. And he's pretty impressed by uh, Hendrix's guitar playing skills. So after the show, he kind of talks about what's happening and he kind of takes him under his wing. So Chandler has Hendrix now as a guitarist for this new band he's looking to, he's looking to create. So he brings in a uh, jazz session drummer, Mitch Mitchell, to play drums. And um, session guitarist, Noel Redding, to play bass. So he has his band formed, his new animals, and instead of going with the proposed name of new animals, they went another direction and just straight up called the band the Jimi Hendrix Experience. And Chaz Chandler, who was initially going to be in the band as the revamp of the animals, decided to just produce with the group instead. It sort of went the route that Led Zeppelin went with, um, you know, Jimmy Page being the only member left of the Yardbirds. He finds new members and basically intends on making this a revamp of the previous group, but then ends up with a completely different group. And that's almost exactly what happened here. And around August of 1966, Kit Lambert, the producer for uh, The Who, greenlit the recording of this album to the first recording sessions were in september of 1966 and the recording for the album completely wrapped up around mid-april of 1967. the recording for this album was crazy hectic it like which is partly why it took so long i mean amidst the recording of the album they were playing shows at random they weren't really on tour they just kind of if like someone called in, they needed an extra spot, they just play a show at a random club, they had TV appearances, they recorded in like four different countries, all while recording this one album, which is why it took so long to 1967 standards. I say to 1967 standards because this is just an observation that I'm making, and this is a totally random tangent that has nothing to do with this album, but it seemed like, like, 60, like, 30 to 60 years ago, people were pumping out albums, like, twice a year, once a year. And I feel like nowadays, it's like an artist will release an album, like, once every two years. And this isn't me trashing modern music. I think a lot of, a lot of modern music is great, but that's, that's not the point. I'm just saying that they just take a lot longer to release albums now. It's, it's, I just feel like an old person whenever I, like, criticize modern music. And then I feel like a brat when I when I criticize older music. Criticizing music is great, especially Aerosmith. Yeah, that beef is still alive. I haven't forgotten, and I never will forget. It's one-sided beef, but beef nonetheless. Dude, I don't even remember what I was talking about. Okay, well then I guess let's go into the track-by-track -track breakdown, dude. <laughs>
Track number one is Purple Haze. Easily one of, if not the most recognizable Jimi Hendrix song ever. The song was written around that main iconic riff. The riff was made um, around December of 1966, backstage at a show when Chaz Chandler and Jimi Hendrix were just fooling around on a guitar. And Chaz Chandler leapt up very quickly and just screamed, that's a hit. All right, Chaz. Okay, calm, calm down, dude. You're not, you're not in a film. Okay, like, j j chill out, dude. Also, Chaz Chandler was six five. Again, I'm going on some tangents here, but like in the House of the Rising Sun music video where everyone's like walking in a line, he's like of like at least a foot taller than some of these guys. Some of the people, some of the guys in the animals had to be like five three because this man like towers over them all. Along with the fact that he's probably wearing, like, combat boots, because that's what every British man wore from, like, 1945 to 1982. But yeah, this song, Purple Haze, just back on track here, was based was based around this riff, and Chaz Chandler made Hendrix write the rest of the song after the show. You can also really tell on the song that uh, Noel Redding was a guitarist beforehand, because the bass on this song basically just exactly mimics the guitar. Very, uh, Paul McCartney-esque in a way. Which, speaking of, Paul McCartney was, like, the first real Jimi Hendrix Experience fan. He first heard of the band from Chaz Chandler around, right after Revolver was released, around September of 1966, and he was the one in, a. Uh, summer of 1967, a year later, to recommend them for the Monterey Pop Festival, uh, which they performed in, and big hit, if you didn't know that, and it kind of launched them into, like, being a household name. Monterey Pop Festival also launched, like, The Who, Otis Redding, Jefferson Airplane, all into, like, the American music canon. Very productive music festival, dude. <laughs> Next up is Manic Depression. Manic Depression is how I feel when I hear Aerosmith. Hey, I'm done now. Or am I? Depression is like if a, like a jazz blues standard became psych rock. This is probably the fir this is the first example on the album of Mitch Mitchell's very obvious jazz drumming. Again, another Led Zeppelin comparison. They kind of did it in here what they did with John Bonham. They basically just took a jazz session musician and made him the drummer of a psych rock band. I feel the song is like a blues jazz standard, sort of like like St. James Infirmary blues, which I could have sworn there was like a live cover that the Jimi Hendrix Experience did of that song, but I can't find it anywhere. I, was, I was like... A hundred percent, not a hundred percent, I was like 99.9% .9 sure that that was a thing because when I was like writing notes down for this video, I ma specifically made that comparison because I was so sure that they covered that, but they didn't. I don't know why I thought that, but yeah. Next up is Hey Joe. Hey Joe is a rock standard written in 1962 by Billy Roberts, and it's been covered by like hundreds, maybe thousands of people. Probably most famously by Jimi Hendrix Experience, um, the Yardbirds and just the Birds. Uh, the Yardbirds and then when the Led Zeppelin lineup were, were the new Yardbirds when they were touring in Scandinavia generally played Hey Joe and Dazed and Confused. And when David Crosby was in the Birds he would sing it. Uh, it was the first ever single released by the Hendrix Experience released uh, the November of 1966. Only in the UK, though. And then it was released as a single in the US in, I think, June of 1967. So, like, a month after uh, the album came out. But a whole, like, seven months after the British single version came out. The song is about a guy shooting his wife and then moving to Mexico. Nice and, nice and pleasant stuff. Next up is Love and Confusion. I only feel the latter when listening to Aerosmith. I do not feel I do not feel love when I listen to Aerosmith. Just confusion. Okay, I promise I'll stop now. Probably. Liver confusion is like basically just jazz fusion and not only in just Mitch Mitchell's drumming, but
Are you done? In all the instrumentation. Following love or confusion is may this be love. Okay, so I guess he's decided at first he wasn't sure if it was love or confusion, but I guess it is love, I guess. May this be love is very interesting. It's like a ballad, but like the drums are really heavy. It's, it's an interesting comparison that I'm gonna make and I don't think that it's entirely correct. I th it's a weird com just hear me out. It's a bit like Long 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 on the White Album by the Beatles. That I'm just making this comparison up in the moment and I'm trying to just wrap my brain around it. I think it works a little bit. Um, last up, not last up on the album, but last for side one is I Don't Live Today. I was gonna make an Aerosmith joke, but I think I think I'm healed now for this video. The only way that I can explain I don't live today, um, and keep in mind this isn't an insult, this is just an observation. It sounds like one of those like peppy, like retro, like rock songs that people were doing in like 2007. I can't think of an example. But that's what it sounds like. What well, that song in like the iPod commercial from like 2008. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, not an insult, but I, just an observation. But yeah, that closes out side one. Opening up side two is The Wind Cries Mary. So some of the lyrics to The Wind Cries Mary were written when Hendrix was in his teens in Seattle in the late 50s and early 60s. But majority of the lyrics were written after he had a fight with his girlfriend over uh, mashed potatoes being too lumpy. Very poetic stuff, you know? Obviously the lyrics aren't about lumpy mashed potatoes, but like the fact that the lyrics were still brought on by lumpy mashed potatoes is just fantastic. I mean, that's, that's just fantastic. Early versions of The Wind Cries Mary were performed with the Blue Flames uh, you know, throughout 1966. Next up is Fire. Fire is like part funk, soul, and psych rock. And it's structured a bit like uh, a Motown pop record from the early to mid 60s with the almost call and response uh, vocals, uh, sort of like shout by the Isley Brothers. That's why I can explain it is it sounds like if, it sounds like if Eric Clapton and Parliament did a collab. Up is third stone from the sun. Stone from the sun is a mostly instrumental song, um, written by Hendrix and Chaz Chandler. It's like a a sci-fi instrumental. There are little spoken word passages along the way from Chaz Chandler and Hendrix. And they wrote the song around August of 1966 when they started bonding, because you know. He was going to be producing their album, so they might as well. And they found that they both really liked sci-fi. And the spoken word passages are like really slowed down, so you can't really hear them except for like one or two. And it's just like a conversation between a guy and an alien. Also throughout the songs, their song, there's just random blood-curdling screams that apparently are from both feedback on Jimi Hendrix's guitar and Chaz Chandler just screaming. I've... I just feel like there's nothing scarier than a 6'5", like, 300-pound British man just screaming his brains out. Halfway through the song, it randomly becomes, like, jazz fusion, so there's that. Next up is Foxy Lady, which is a Jimi Hendrix standard. I feel like it's one of his most popular songs. played it at basically every show. It's a little overrated for me. I, it's alright. It's also apparently about Roger Daltrey's wife. So that's something. And on top of that, it was also one of the first songs recorded for the album. Lastly is the album's namesake, Are You Experienced? Answer is maybe. Shut up. You keep time in this song, they use a reverse snare drum, and there's a lot of reverse instrumentation and sounds, and a reverse guitar solo, and it sounds a little bit inspired by uh, Tomorrow Never Knows by the Beatles, which was on Revolver, which is entirely possible because Revolver was released like three weeks before the recording for this album started, so it's entirely possible that that is what it's based on. That will do it for the track by track breakdown. Now let's get into my thoughts. <laughs>
this is a good album. I honestly would go so far as to say it's my the only really Hendrix album out of the three that I like. Access Bold of Love, I'm not a big fan of. And Electric Ladyland, there's like maybe there's like four or five there's a solid four or five, six songs on there that I really like, but I like really like this album. I like I like every song on it, but I can't really say the same for the rest of for the rest of Hendrix discography. Except for his live albums. His live albums are great, but in terms of the three studio albums, I think this is by far the best one. But yeah, that's Jimi Hendrix experience. Are you experienced? Are you? But yeah, I'm back from another week-long break. Sorry about that. I just didn't really have any time to record anything, but here we are. Also, another thing. I'm stopping using the Monty Python intermission music for outros because I have used that song as outro music since, like, the third episode of the series, but... I don't know, whoever owns friggin' Monty Python, Warner Brothers or something, has just randomly started copyright claiming me on the last two videos, and I don't know why. So I'm gonna use Celebration by Otis McDonald, which most people know as the uh, oversimplified outro. So that is the new outro music. Here's the outro. Goodbye, bozos.